do you think Turkey will ever become a, an EU member state? The issue of Turkey joining the EU is not relevant anymore. Turkey has been a candidate since 1964 and it has seen other countries with shorter applications joining the EU before itself. Uh, Erdogan has changed the way Turkish politics are made. Turkey is one of the countries uh, with the highest number of journalists uh, in jail. Welcome back to the Brussels Signal Studio. My name is Justin Stairs and the subject of today's podcast is Turkey. We have a specialist for you online. His name is Remy Daniel and he is a researcher at the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv. He specializes in Turkish affairs and he also coordinates the Europe Research Program at the Institute. He studied in Paris, uh, has a PhD in Turkish-Israeli uh, relations and he's here with us. Can you hear me, Remy? Thank you for your time. Thank you for the invitation. I can hear you indeed. Okay, well, let's start. Uh, lots of um, possible subjects of discussion, but maybe as we are here in Brussels, we should catch up with Turkey and its aspirations for becoming a European Union member state. And most people here in Brussels have forgotten, to be honest with you, that Turkey is a, an applicant uh, because it's been going on for decades now and has been on the back burner for a number of reasons. Um, perhaps you could give us uh, a quick summary of where Turkey is and is there any, do you think Turkey will ever become a, an EU member state? I think that uh, most of people now agree that the issue of Turkey joining the EU is not relevant anymore, that the possibilities that existed maybe at the beginning of the 2000s when it looked the best uh, are now gone. I think that on the Turkish side there have, be, there have been some disappointments and even frustrations to see the developments of relations between the EU and other countries or the fact that Cyprus joined uh, the EU before Turkey. I, I just want to remind here that Turkey has been a candidate since 1964, and it has seen other countries with shorter applications joining the EU before itself. Um, it's also uh, clear now that Turkey is also frustrated to see that Ukraine has been proposed to, uh, to start a process while it's still waiting. And I also think that Turkey actually and the Turkish population, although some polls show that within the Turkish population, you have still a big part uh, of the society wanting to join the EU. I think that the two sides went too, too far apart uh, today. And it's very clear, uh, both in the minds of the Turkish government uh, and in the mind of the Turkish society. And I think also that the Europeans have been very clear uh, after the, the last hopes of progresses. First, the Europeans have stopped the process because of domestic issues and internal issues within the EU. And now it is very clear that the state of the Turkish democracy does not permit Turkey to join the EU in the short term. So the question of Turkey joining the EU is maybe uh, not relevant, it, it will not happen in the short term, but uh, we still see that both sides have a lot of common interests and a lot of reasons to continue to cooperate, and that will be the big issue, how to transform all the frustrations that have accumulated between the EU and Turkey into opportunities for better collaboration and cooperation, because once again, both sides need it. You mentioned the state of Turkish democracy. What did you mean? I think it's very clear that uh, since uh, at least the beginning of the 2000s, uh, 2010, sorry, uh, Erdogan has changed the way Turkish politics are made. We see uh, that Turkey is one of the countries uh, with the highest number of journalists uh, in jail. 
we see that although the electoral processes are still relatively uh, free, and we see that in the fact that the opposition is still able to win in local elections, we see that the election campaigns are not fair. We see elected officials sent to jail. We see actually with a state that is not a liberal democracy, if it has ever been it, but we see a big, big uh, trend toward autocracy in Turkey in the last 15 years. And I think it will continue uh, as long as Erdogan is in power. Uh, one thing, you're the expert, one one thing I have picked up on over the years is that Turkey seems to be uh, turning uh, towards Islam and is more religious country or religion has entered politics to a larger degree over the last couple of uh, decades at least. Is that fair? It is fair to say that Erdogan basically from comes from a party that was an Islamist party and although uh, his big success is based on the fact that he moved away from the most extreme Islamists within Turkey and presented himself as a more liberal, uh, conservative, but like in a certain Christian, Islam, uh, Muslim democratic way, as there are Christian Democrats uh, in Europe. Uh, we see in the last, once again, 15 years, that Erdogan came back to uh, his religious roots using Islam as a way to mobil mobilize um, his electorate. We see also the passing of some laws that are stricter on alcohol, that are stricter on, on women also. And we saw a few very symbolic steps. Maybe the most symbolic one is the fact that Hagia Sophia, the famous a uh, museum that was a mosque before and a church before, like the symbol of the um, Byzantine Empire that then became the symbol of the Ottoman Empire as a mosque and then a symbol of the new Turkey when Ataturk transformed this mosque into a museum. This was a very strong symbol for Islamists in Turkey for a long time. And Erdogan, a few years ago, transformed this museum back into a mosque, showing he was putting Turkey back on a more Muslim track. But this being said, although religion is more important in politics, as you said, more important in education also, as you said, we see two things. First of all, uh, Turkey is still a secular state according to its constitution. Alcohol is still completely legal. Uh, there is no mandatory headscarf for women. So even after all these years of Erdogan, Turkey is much more secular that the majority than the majority of uh, Arab states or than Iran, for example, that is very clear. And we must also say that his attempts to bring back religion to society have not been completely successful. The younger generation in Turkey is more secular and less religious than Erdogan's uh, generation. And in a certain way, it shows also a certain failure despite very intense attempts to bring the religion more in the center of Turkish society, it doesn't work really within the wider population. Mm, okay, interesting. And obviously, Turkey, uh, as we know here in Europe, uh, sits between East and West. Um, so let's move on to Turkey and uh, its relations with other parts of the world, the Middle East in particular. Now, you explain to me, please, um, the relationship today between, let's start with Israel and Turkey, shall we? I mean, famously, uh, one of the headlines that managed to get through here in uh, Europe was uh, Erdogan uh, caught saying that Netanyahu was worse than Hitler. I mean, uh, explain the context behind that uh, statement, please. So if we go a few years earlier, we can say that Erdogan came into power when the relations between Turkey and Israel were at their peak. Uh, it came after the 1990s, which were great years for the relations between Turkey and Israel. At the beginning, Erdogan maintained these very good relations. And then we saw a continuous degradation of the relations starting in 2009 and continuing in the 2010s, we had the very famous Mavi Marmara incident, uh, which almost led to a rupture in the relations between the two countries. Then we had 
a short normalization between 2016 and 2018, then very, very difficult years until 2021. And that was actually the context of October 7th when we are looking at Turkish-Israeli relations really just before the uh, massacres by uh, Hamas on October 7th, 2023, the relations between the two countries were improving. Uh, since 2021, we saw high-level meetings, including a meeting between Erdogan and Netanyahu. So actually, the countries were in a rather positive path after decades of very tense relations. What October 7th did to the Turkish-Israeli relations and what the Israeli uh, reaction to October 7th did to the uh, Turkish-Israeli relations was actually uh, destroy everything because we saw very, very quickly that Turkey adopted the most uh, extreme anti-Israeli position possible. Uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, speeches by Erdogan. Erdogan is uh, always comparing Netanyahu to Hitler, saying that uh, Israel is, make, is doing things in Gaza that, that are worse than what the Nazi did and goes along again and again with these uh, accusations. He also mobilized a lot uh, the state apparatus in Turkey to bring this narrative to the wider world. Uh, Turkish media in English are also using the same tone. Uh, the Directorate of Communication of the Turkish presidency is also now investing a lot of efforts to attack uh, Israel. So that's uh, what you mentioned concerning the words that Erdogan uses. We see also that Turkey is, is trying to be very active in the diplomatic front against Israel by uh, uh, attacking Israel, by accusing Israel, by supporting Iran against Israel in the uh, showdown between the two countries, by very strongly supporting Hamas, and also uh, by trying uh, to uh, attack Israel in the international uh, law institution. And the third thing that we see uh, concerning Turkish, uh, Turkey's reaction to uh, the war between uh, Israel and Hamas and Hezbollah is uh, the fact that Erdogan decided in May to start a boycott of, relation, uh, of trade relations uh, between uh, Turkey and Israel. And I think that mm. is a very important move. First of all, because the trade between the two countries was very important bo for both of them and also because uh, it was actually the thing that survived any cr political crisis between the two countries trade between turkey and israel was developing regardless of all the tensions between the two governments and also it's a very symbolic move it shows that erdogan is really ready to sacrifice part of the turkish interest economic interest to show its hostility to, to Israel. And that's the situation today. So we are actually in a very important and deep crisis of the relations between Turkey and Israel. And why? Well, why has uh, Erdogan uh, taken this position? I think there are a few reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, he is under domestic pressure because uh, the Turkish society in its vast majority supports uh, the Palestinians and opposes Israel. It is true, of course, uh, of the Islamist uh, population that is the core of Erdogan's uh, electorate, but it is also true for other parts of the Turkish society. So Erdogan is under domestic pressure and he felt it in local elections uh, in in the middle of this year when, when he lost and Gaza was part of the reasons for that. I think also that there are ideological uh, reasons for that. Actually, Erdogan is very close to the, to the Muslim Brotherhood. And we saw that when he supported the Mosi in Egypt, when he supported Qatar in the Gulf, and he has always been a very strong Hamas supporter which is very specific because a lot of countries support the Palestinian cause, but say they prefer to deal with the Palestinian Authority and not Hamas. That is not Erdogan's position. For ideological reason, his proximity goes directly to Hamas. 
And also another ideological reason is the fact that Turkey wants to see itself, what is called sometimes Neo-Ottoman, even if it's not completely uh, precise, Turkey wants to play a greater role in the Middle East and uh, in Jerusalem in particular. And the last reason would be linked to this one. I think that Erdogan is in a certain way quite frustrated that Turkey doesn't play a bigger role uh, in the situation uh, in Gaza, for example. Uh, Erdogan talks a lot. Uh, Turkey also does quite a lot. It is one of the most important provider of assistance to the Palestinian population in Gaza. And still, uh, Israel, the US, the EU, and Palestinians themselves prefer to talk through uh, the help and intermediation of other countries, Qatar, Egypt, which means that Turkey does a lot of noise. Turkey makes a lot of moves, but Turkey has very, very little impact. And this creates a frustration that also explains the radicalization of Erdogan's position uh, within the month. Okay. Now, if, if I heard you correctly, you, you, you said Turkey, you mentioned that Turkey was supporting Iran. Did I hear you correctly? It is a little more complicated than that. Uh, uh, Turkey and Iran have always had complicated relations that are somehow sometimes described as being neither excellent uh, nor uh, very bad. It's always in the middle. And the, when we look at the situation as a whole, the relations between Turkey and Iran have some frictions. They have some frictions in Syria because Iran supports Bashar al-Assad and Turkey's uh, supports the insurgents. There are some frictions around Azerbaijan because Iran uh, does not want to see a too strong Azerbaijan and supports Armenia and Turkey is one of Azerbaijan's most uh, loyal and intense allies. We see also tensions between Turkey and Iran in northern Iraq when they support opposing groups in the Kurdish region. So the relations are not perfect because you have all of these frictions. But if you look at Turkey's reaction to the um, opposition between Israel and Iran and basically to the war, because now we have attacks coming from both sides, Turkey has always criticized Israel and presented it as being an aggressor and Iran being basically only in a position of self-defense. So we see that the frictions between Turkey and Iran are less important for Erdogan than its opposition, his opposition to Israel. And that's why he decided in the current conflict to have at least, in his, in his words, a position that is uh, leaning towards Iran and not Israel. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay. And so let's throw Donald Trump into this mix. Uh, since his uh, election victory, um, I have seen some news reports coming out of uh, uh, Turkey suggesting that relations could be uh, reset, that it could be good news. Um, how, how, how will Trump's arrival affect the scene? Well, First, maybe we can say that the relations between Joe Biden and Erdogan were very bad because they were very opposite men. Erdogan being an autocrat, uh, trying to play an, an ambiguous game between Russia and NATO and in Syria and things like that. While uh, Biden, even in the campaign, during the campaign in 2020, uh, had made clear that he didn't want to work too much with Erdogan because of the state of the Turkish democracy, because of Turkey's policy towards the Kurds. So the relations between the two men were very, very uh, cold, although at the end Biden and Erdogan reached some agreements, for example, around the sale of uh, American planes to Turkey. Uh, if we look at the first uh, term of uh, Donald Trump and its relations with Erdogan, we see that the situation in, is a little ambiguous too. Uh, on the positive uh, side, we could say that uh, Trump and Erdogan are much more uh, compatible uh, than uh, Erdogan and Biden were. 
uh, Trump, in a certain way, loves to have these personal, transactional relations with uh, what he sees as strong leaders. And Erdogan is a perfect example of that. And it worked uh, in the past, which meant also that, for example, uh, Trump let Erdogan act in northern Syria without interfering because of on the basis on, of this very personal and transactional uh, relations. On the other hand, uh, the imprevisibility that, that Trump, like this instability that sometimes Trump has towards other countries, uh, had also an effect on Turkey when Turkey bought some Russian uh, un, uh, air defense uh, equipment. Trump reacted in a very, very strong way, hurting Turkey's economy, hurting uh, Turkey's um, military industry. So we saw four years during Trump's first term in which both leaders could reach some agreements much better than uh, in later years. But still, uh, Trump showed also that when Erdogan was not doing what he wanted, he could be able to strike Turkey very hard. So actually, you were right when you said it's going to be a reset. I think it's going to be a little more positive than during the last four years, but still, there sh I think there could be some unexpected developments, both negatively and positively, in the relations between Washington and Ankara. Okay, okay. And so I want to come back to the, to the Kurds, uh, but before we do, and now give me the, the summary of Turkey and its role in the Ukraine conflict, because I know that Turkey has at least been, in part, one of the mediators. The, the grain deal, if I'm not mistaken, was brokered by, by Turkey. Could Turkey have a role in, in, in Trump's quest to bring peace to, to that conflict? So Turkey has man tried to maintain uh, good relations uh, with both sides on the uh, conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Because, because mostly if its interests, uh, Turkey had uh, good relations with uh, Ukraine. Ukraine is an important part of Turkey's plan to have an independent uh, national military industry. Uh, a lot of grain that Turkey uh, needs comes from Ukraine, comes also from Russia. So uh, Turkey had an interest to maintain good relations between the two countries. and. It has done so. For example, compared to Europe, uh, Turkey has not decided on almost any sanctions towards Russia in any way. Uh, it has also maintained good relations uh, with Ukraine by supporting it uh, militarily. You, you remember maybe all the fuzz there was on social medias around the Bayraktar UAV that were used, that are Turkish UAVs used. Uh, by Ukraine forces. Uh, and it has also, as you said, uh, had some diplomatic successes by uh, being able to bring to this grain deal you, you mentioned, also an ex a prisoner uh, exchange deal between the two sides. Uh, at the, in the last year or so, uh, Turkey uh, was less relevant because when the war intensified, there was no room left for negotiation, which means that there was no room left for mediators. And both sides, both Russia and Ukraine, became more frustrated to see that Turkey was unable to uh, choose a side. So what was a positive thing when the war uh, was still on lower intensity became negative for Turkey when it is on higher intensity. I see. Uh, Trump could use it, could use Turkey, uh, but I think it will also be part of the broader com context of the situation because maybe one thing I can mention to bridge between the situation uh, in the Turkish-American relations and the situation in the Middle East is that the very, very extreme Turkish position against Israel has also created a lot, a lot of tensions with the uh, U.S. administration, and we will see now how it will be possible to conciliate both things with the new president. 
Now that I can see it is really complex, isn't it? Okay, now there are two other two other topics that I want to broach with you. That let's do the Kurds. Um, I mentioned this, I mean, you're the expert. I've never actually been to Turkey. I would love to go. I would love to see, uh, in particular, the the Roman uh, ruins. Um, but uh, that aside, I have heard from uh, some of the, the Kurdish diaspora actually here in Belgium. I've heard, I've listened to their stories just because I've met them uh, by accident at uh, receptions. And one story I heard, anecdote, let's call it, is that the word uh, Kurd doesn't exist in the, in the Turkish dictionary. I don't even know if that's true, but uh, I, I'm, I give you this anecdote basically as a segue into the situation regarding the Kurds in Turkey. What's it like today? The, the, the situation is a little better than what, what, what the anecdote says, but it is true that when Turkey became the Turkish Republic after World War One and uh, Turkey's war of independence, it built a national identity that basically negated the existence of Kurds within the Turkish nation or the Turkish uh, national territory. So it is true that for decades, the policy of the Turkish state was to negate uh, a Turkish, a Kurdish language, Kurdish identity. And it is true that Kurd, although it existed as a word, was a taboo in political speeches and uh, political uh, discussions. In the, during the 1980, there was a terrorist group called the PKK, the Kurdistan's Workers' Movement, a Marxist terrorist group, that decided to fight these policies in a violent way. And it led to what is called the Black Decade in Turkish history, the 1990s, where you have a guerrilla basically going on on Kurdish, uh, Turkey's uh, southeastern flank between the Turkish army and this Kurdish group. When Erdogan arrived, actually, what is very interesting, and it had he adopted a, a much smoother policy. That is why, for example, Kurd is not taboo anymore. There is even a TV channel, a state TV channel in Kurdish now in Turkey. Oh, yes, I heard so that, there yes. were some progresses, but when he needed the help of the nationalist movement in some closer years since 2015, he came back to a very strong anti-Kurdish policy. And you see it, first of all, in the Turkish operation in northern Syria and northern Iraq, when you have very strong actions by the Turks against the Kurdish movements there. Although these are the movements that, for example, uh, fighted ISIS in earlier years, and you have also a very a radicalization of the nationalist policy in Turkey, within Turkey now, with the militarization of the situation, with Kurdish mayors being removed from power by the government. So after of what looked as like a better decade when Erdogan arrived to power, we are now going back in a more um, aggressive policy toward the Kurds, even though Erdogan is trying in the last month to change it, his policy again because he needs the help of the Kurds to change the constitution to stay in power. So once again, everything is very complicated and imbricated because now Erdogan is trying to improve the situation of the Kurds to maintain his autocratic rule over Turkey. And Incredible. That's the situation of the Incredible. Country. Like a whirling dervish over there. Turkey's right. Every, everyone is an enemy and everyone is a friend at the same time. That's fascinating. Let's, okay. let, let's finish with, uh, with Greece. Um, now, one, again, uh, one of the quotes that has got through to us here in, in, uh, in Brussels, let's say, was when uh, Erdogan stated that if Turkey wanted to, it could, it could uh, bring the night down over Greece or bring, turn out all the lights. Obviously, the tensions have been uh, uh, taught, let's say, between the two countries for a long time. Um, I know from personal uh, relations with, with people in Greece that there are, if I'm not mistaken, the French have uh, aircraft uh, uh, based in Greece uh, to protect the country from a possible uh, Turkish strike. I mean, let's have it from, from you. The, the, what is the state of relations between Greece and Turkey? And is there a possibility that the two sides could fight another war? 
Uh, it's a very complicated uh, situation that has also a lot of implications for a lot of other countries because, because one of the things that we must say now is that Turkey and Greece are both members of NATO. So where, if we are at the time where NATO is supposed to get more uh, stronger and stronger to react to Russian's aggression, uh, you have to avoid internal division and friction that could lead to war. And since the beginning, since Turkey and Greece joined NATO, this is one of the weaknesses of the alliance, this possibility of war between Turkey and Greece, especially when other countries, as you said, like France, also choose a side. France clearly uh, chose to support Greece by selling aircrafts, by uh, having a defense agree agreement with Greece. You have other countries that are more on the Turkish side, Italia for Italy, for example, or the UK. But yes, it is an important uh, friction. In the same way, uh, at the end of the 2010s, when Erdogan was very nationalistic, the, the war either between Greece and Turkey or between Turkey and Cyprus, which is not part of the NATO, but which is part of the EU and is very strongly supported by Greece, was a very strong possibility. Uh, in the last years, Erdogan has been a little more moderate. It's what I told you about Israel. It is also true toward Greece. It's also to, true toward uh, other countries. And there was also a very smart use of what is called sometimes, you know, catastrophe diplomacy when Greece helped Turkey in 2023 after the earthquake uh, in Turkey. Uh, so the situation is a little better that, than what it had been uh, maybe uh, five years ago, but the frictions are still there. Uh, you have every other month a statement by Turkey, a move by Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean or uh, in Cyprus that reminds us that the tensions are still here in what is could be very dangerous because Greece and Turkey are actually in an arm race with a lot of investments to buy better weapons, better equipment, and the, the frictions that exist between the two countries, even in better time, still exist. So the situation remains very, very, very sensitive with, once again, a lot of implications for a lot of countries. That's, let's end it there. That's great. Uh, we very much appreciate your time, Rémi, Daniel, and thank you very much for watching. Thank you.